Well, good morning, fellow investors and small company enthusiasts. Uh, happy Saturday morning, uh, happy November Eve, happy Halloween, and uh, all that stuff. My name is Mark Robertson. I am founder and managing partner of Manifest Investing, and I'm joined here by my dear colleague. And when we say investing raconteur, we mean it. Ken, <laughs> Ken Kavula. Good morning, Ken. You really like that word, don't you, Mark? <laughs> well, well, yeah, you know, and no raconteur is complete without the hat this morning. Without the hat. Okay, thank you. All right. You know, you... a big shout out to all of our friends in the audience. Uh, uh, it's nice to see you up and around at this time of the morning, and we're glad to have you, you with us. There are so many familiar names on our attendees list this morning, so we're glad you're here, and we're going to try to keep this to an hour, hour and 15, and let's get started, Mark, okay? Okay, and uh, I want to do this now before I forget. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Those of you out there that have sent us suggestions and helped us shape this, and this is one of my favorite things to do. I think, Ken, I think it's one of your favorite things to do. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it just can make such a difference in our portfolios. And I was able to add Seventh Heaven to that uh, co cover slide as of yesterday. So good stuff. All right. Quick reminder, no investment recommendation whatsoever is intended. Please, please, please do your own homework. Make your own decisions. Everything that we're doing here is an educational demonstration. It's intended to take the lessons learned over eight decades with the Modern Investment Club movement and extend them to investing today. So we're basically taking the, the practices and analytical methods and all that kind of stuff that helps us to discover excellent companies and buy them when they're at good prices. And uh, that's what we'll be talking about here today. Everything's an opinion, everything's a case study. Please again, repeating for the second time, do your own homework and make your own decisions. Uh, we may own some of these, we'll try to remember to let you know about that. We do run a variety of programs, including a monthly roundtable web webcast. If you'd like to be added to a reminder list about that, send an email to ncavola1 at comcast.net. If you have follow-up questions, our two email addresses are on the slide there. And uh, if you'd like copies of the slides, please send me an email, markr at manifestinvesting.com. And uh, just a quick note about stuff. You're going to see some very, we're going to go through this stuff pretty quickly. We, we're we're both feeling pretty snappy. Are you feeling snappy, Ken? No. No. no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not going to snip or snap at anybody today. I'm going to try not to. Okay? I, I, I don't mean snappy in a negative way. Just you know, oh, okay. All right. I, crisp like the the weather outside. Crisp like a really good apple. Okay, I'll take that. Okay. So they are pretty busy, but this is a discussion deck. If we were in a room with you guys in an auditorium or stadium seating or whatever, a lot of these slides would be broken down into a series of three or four slides. So just keep that in mind. And just a quick reminder that uh, don't eat the crayons. All right, here's our agenda real quickly. We're going to talk about MoCon and Chuck Almond for a minute. We're going to talk about the results, which clicked in at 4 p.m. yesterday afternoon. I was on pins and needles uh, for reasons we'll describe. And then we'll go through our selections, the 20 companies. I wasn't sure we we're going to make it to 20, but we did. 20 best small companies for 2022. And then we're going to maybe do a little bit of a discussion on the word small as not being the right descriptor. A few moments on investing with friends and uh, M1 Financial as a resource. And then we'll... Uh, We'll probably not take too many questions along the way, but we will stick around for Q&A at the end of the session. Anything you want to add to that, Ken? Yeah, I felt really good, Mark, at the end of our selection uh, process yesterday uh, because I think we actually had 22 or 23 companies that, that could, could justifiably hold a place on this list. Uh, we weren't having to reach down and, and scrape the bottom of the barrel for our 19th or 20th choices. So I'm I'm looking forward to putting them out there and seeing the reaction that people have. Okay. Go ahead and, and talk about at eight decades of lessons learned, Ken. Well, we, we all know the, the drill and, and we can state these rules in so many different ways, but uh, essentially uh, invest regularly and stay invested. 
uh, also have patience and discipline. Those two words aren't on this slide, but they're key to being a, what I consider a better investor. Uh, look for growth companies and look for leadership growth companies. Buy the best and then prudently diversify. And that's where this whole uh, idea about small companies comes into play. Uh, because to us, diversification not only means by sector and industry, but it also means by size of companies, by growth, sales growth of companies, uh, knowing full well that you need faster growing companies uh, at one end of the spectrum to balance out some of the great blue chip, slower growing companies that you want to have in your portfolio to provide you with stability. So it's a, it's a balance that you have to keep rebalancing. Uh, you know, the small get medium, the medium get big. Uh, some of the big go away and you have to keep adding small to the mix uh, to make sure that your growth for sales stays up there. Uh, we set a benchmark of around 12% sales growth. We think that's enough in most markets uh, to keep you ahead of the market itself. Yeah, and just to double down on what Ken had to say, we refer to it as all of the above investing. You're looking at a chart that charts the value line arithmetic average versus the Wilshire 5000, which is dominated by 20 companies or less because it's cap weighted. That is the basically the S&P 500 um, dominated by those blue chip stalwarts that Ken was just talking about. The difference between the two graphs, more small companies, more smaller companies, faster growing companies in the red one. I think everybody in the room likes the red one better than the blue one. And uh, we just encourage the, uh, a mix, a prudent blend of small, medium, and large companies with enough growth. All right. Let's spend a few minutes talking about just the raw motivation for doing this. Um, Chuck Allman has been lost for a few years. Now he passed away a few years ago. But he was a tremendous com contributor to the National Association of Investors and uh, Better Investing Magazine. And he used to write a, a newsletter called Growth Stock Outlook. And he, he basically did it for decades, had a wonderful time doing it. He was notorious for being bearish and cautious. And uh, uh, what was so fascinating to watch is... Uh, how we would have, you know, a few companies like Automated Data Processing, ADP, and you can see the numbers there. By the way, it's that uh, 48,665 percentage number is massive until you really put it in context and discover that it's really only 15% per year. I say only, that's a fantastic number, but we know a lot of companies that qualify for that treatment. So, yeah, we can do this. And uh, But the, the point to be made with Almond is he achieved spectacular returns despite the fact that he often was loaded up on cash in case he wanted to go shopping as much as 75 percent in cash at times and he used to have this company called mocon and a few other companies like it in the portfolio very small company you can read more about it at the links there but um it was just fascinating to watch how this little in his backyard company it's actually out of minneapolis uh, so, it was ultimately acquired by Amatech. Um, it actually bolstered the performance magnificently as a, I guess you would call it a micro cap. Here's the point that I want to make. Back when he was investing in this company over the years, he was investing in it when it had as little as a million dollars in annual revenues. And uh, so that number, you want to be obviously more careful as it gets smaller, but when you can find a company like this in your backyard, it can make all the difference in the world. And, and Ken, I'll let you expound on some of those names at the bottom because we have lived through kind of that almond experience a few times. Well, they're, those our names are so familiar to me because they represent, for the most part, home runs uh, over my 35, uh, 30, more than 35 years now of investing. Uh, and uh, I, I keep telling people, you don't have to hit uh, a home run every week or a home run every month. Uh, you know, if you can hit half a dozen or, or uh, so home runs during your investing career and be smart enough not to move away from them, allow them to 
to mature to their uh, height of profitability, then you, you end up with a portfolio you can be really pleased with. I have owned every one of those stocks uh, in that box there, Mark, at one time or another, and I still own one, two, three, four, five, six. I still own seven, eight of them. <laughs> so uh, I'm right. I'm looking at 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 part of my my uh, IRA and my wife's IRA when when I'm looking at this list. Well, in that case, you're buying dinner. We'll move on. While, you know, you're starting to brag. I buy dinner all, right. all the time, Mark, so don't worry about it. You know? All right. Okay, a little bit of foreshadowing here. Uh, as the clock wound down yesterday, we did check in with a return that beat the market by five percentage points. Uh, we'll cover that in more detail, but applause, applause, raise a glass, all that good stuff. And Ken, would you like to describe a little bit of the heritage here? Be snappy. Well, we've gone back to uh, the middle of, of the first decade of this century, and we started following Forbes' uh, list of best small companies. Uh, we found it to be a very interesting source of new ideas. And so when Manifest began allowing these dashboards, we put dashboards together, and uh, we decided to see if we could beat the entire list. Uh, so we started picking uh, a subset from the Forbes list of 20 or 25 companies and putting them up against the Wiltshire 5000. Here you can see the results for those things throughout the year. One terrible year. Most of you know what happened in 2008. Uh, a number of very average years. And what's really nice is that during the uh, Wiltshire's years of small gains, uh, the small stocks tended to just outpaced the Wiltshire by huge amounts, double and triple and quadruple uh, the growth rates. Uh, as the Wiltshire did better in certain years, look at 2013 or 2021 for that matter, uh, then we, we come much closer to, together. Um, the red box is uh, what happens after Forbes stops publishing the list and Mark and I decide that we're gonna do this ourselves. And so we're going to continue to look for a list of 20 or 25 companies. We're going to add the, the proviso that not only do these companies have to be smallish, uh, but they have to uh, be something that we might find investable at the point of, of choosing the company. So we're looking for companies that have PARs, uh, that are uh, something that can beat the market by four or five or six or more points. And we're looking at companies, and we've kind of uh, played around with what the capitalization should be, and we've discarded the idea of capitalization entirely, and we've instead focused on, on revenue, and we're looking at companies with revenues of about $2 billion or less. Uh, we've set a bottom of about $50 million. We're not going to go in for the micro cap or the penny stocks, not yet at least. Uh, but with those kind of, of provisos in between. I think we have a set of rules coming up. We do. Uh, but, but we've been doing quite well. And, and this last year, uh, we beat the market by five points. And over our history, you can see that our annualized return is over 20 uh, versus just under 15 for the, the Wiltshire 5000. Uh, it's a record that I'm very proud of, very pleased about. And I think it demonstrates what small companies can add uh, to anybody's portfolio. Yeah, and the, the whole moral of the story is we, we said, uh, let's use what Nicholson taught us and let's demand as much from our small companies as the rest of our core companies. And uh, some small companies are core companies. I do want to let you guys in on a little bit of a secret because it almost drove me to drinking. In fact, it did drive me to drinking a little bit. Um, uh, Tuesday evening. We're at 50%. The market's at 40. By lunchtime, by, I'm not kidding. You talk about a reminder that stock prices fluctuate. By lunchtime on Wednesday, 12.30 p.m., uh, we had a 1.9% lead over the Wilshire 5,000. So this is this is the middle of the week, just, uh, you know, literally one day later after. I mean, I was doing a victory dance, and then uh, it's like a semi. 
And you were telling everybody about how great we were doing whenever you had the opportunity. We're, so, we're gonna we're gonna censor you next year, okay? So, so th thank you. We ended up at forty six versus forty one. We'll take it. All right. <laughs> Here's the companies that did it. Not going to spend a lot of time going down the list other than to point out that uh, uh, banks were very, very good to us this year, banks and financial institutions. And uh, we had a couple that didn't work out so well down at the bottom, and there's stories behind all of these. But all in all, pretty good list. Um, I do. I'm very grateful to Western Alliance for tripling uh, since last Halloween. And... Uh, what is really kind of cool, and we make this point all the time, so I'll make it very quickly, the gains in Western Alliance dwarf those three losses at the bottom. Just do the math. And it's, it's, just, uh, it's just incredible how much uh, a successful selection, and these are all part of the Rule 5, can actually do. Any quick yeah, comments yeah. before we move on, Ken? Yeah, and in a year when the, the market's doing 40-plus percent, uh, don't uh, feel... Uh, that you've failed when you pick stocks that only do 39 or 38 uh, percent. The the bottom middle of this list from form factor down to about Malibu boats, uh, those stocks did not quite beat the market. But then again, how often do you have a market doing 41.9 percent? Not very often. Um, yeah, not very often. All right. And then we do have to do this, Ken. Uh, we debated on whether we could do this if we had the the courage to do it. We do need a moment of silence. Can't tell medical. It tormented us for years. You can see the returns up there at the top. It it frustrated. It tormented us. A year ago, you could go back and listen to the recording of the webcast. We talked about should we include it or not. It's it you know the numbers say that it should be on the list for 2021. And uh, Ken and I both said no. We can't. We can't take anymore. And I'm just going to encourage everybody to be careful about that type of uh, psychology and sentiment and try to check your emotions at the door because the slide speaks for itself. It would have been at, the same, performers. at the same time, we knew that one of Cantel's biggest problems was its management team and uh, the, the opportunity for that company to be bought by Steris uh, suddenly took the management out of the picture and, and opened up the the quality of the kinds of things that Cantel was manufacturing, and, and that's something that that while you can bet on, you never can be absolutely certain about. Uh, I'm not sure uh, that if the purchase agreement would not have been in place, I'm not sure that Cantel would have had any better year than it had in 18, 19, or 20. Uh, it, it had a it had a basically subpar management team. It just was not operating like any of its peer group. Yep, tough story, but it's always good to remember. All right, here's just a really quick reminder of where many of these ideas come from. We canvas and scour all of these from the Motley Fools to Kathy Wood and funds like her that have demonstrated success over the decades in, in picking small type companies. Uh, Chris Jenner is the gentleman there in the upper center. And then some of the other places we turned, a Better Investing's uh, predefined screen for small companies. The lists that are published by Fortune and Forbes, we're gonna talk about Fortune a little bit. They came out with their new list uh, night before last. Uh, Hoover's Handbook, uh, the Financial Times, which uh, Sean Mason and I covered a couple of weeks ago on uh, bull sessions and social media itself. So these are just some of the places we go hunting for opportunity. All right. Just a, a quick play-by-play -play on what some of the rules are. And I, Ken and I debate whether small is the right word. We're looking for a better word than small. They should be promising. They should be exciting. They should be perhaps even earlier stage than we're normally comfortable with. But um, this evolving, fast growing, all that stuff applies. When we say small, that's what we're talking about. So really, we focus in on sales growth greater than 12%. We do have some general guidelines on revenues. We'd like to, the company not to be too big in terms of annual sales, although we will you know, give a little bit of latitude. And again, as Ken was saying a few minutes ago, we don't like to go too small in annual revenues. But again, if we found a Mocon or another Neogen, you get, it gets some latitude. 
no penny stocks. Asset-based businesses are, are not excluded, but again, a higher growth rate is not that common for most financial sector companies. There are exceptions, and we love those exceptions. So we just want excellent quality and uh, a good combination of expectations for the return forecast. And again, good quality. I think I said quality twice. Here's a quick little exercise that demonstrates the type of companies where we generally find opportunity. The one on the left is the general stock market diversification by sector. The one on the right is what you see with a typical investment club. Uh, you don't have to be invested in every sector. You go where the opportunities present themselves. And uh, that's a fairly common type uh, pie on the right. And then just to really annoy you and intrigue you this morning, uh, a quote from Mr. O'Hara, the chairman of the National Association of Investors for it was actually over 50 years, ultimately, because he lingered for quite a while, even after he was officially retired. And, uh, I mean, that's a quote. He said it to me in the hallway. So just something to keep in mind. With that in mind, much like a fantasy football chart where we're doing draft picks, um, this is uh, the breakdown of the market by sectors. In a, in a traditional investment club, we'd be filling in the white spots. So let's see how we do. We're going to use that to keep score. And one last chart before we get underway. I know this is busy. This one's complicated. I apologize for that. But what it is a reminder of is this is not just theory, guys. Um, the, the box in the middle, the dark area, is from a presentation by a guy by the name of Brian Feraldi. And he talks about how there are points in a company's life cycle when PEs are tough, if not impossible. And the majority of our investing, especially the core stuff, is somewhere down the middle of that black chart and favoring the right-hand side. That's where the up straight and parallels live. And, Ken, you can jump in whenever you need to, but we're, what we're talking about here today is maybe favoring the left-hand side of that a little bit more and pushing to where companies might be closer to break even. So there is an overlap in the two. We love our core companies, but we also like opportunity in some of the others. And let me just kind of walk down the chart from top to bottom. Again, it's not just theory. These are real numbers of a real company. And you're looking at the, the, sales, the sales numbers up at the top from 1997 on. So these are all sales numbers that you see up at the top. And notice there's a definite uh, curve of sorts and a fairly constant uh, growth situation going on. The earnings for that company are down here. Notice that they kind of languish over a period of years while the company is forming and emerging you know, somewhere on the left-hand side of this chart. But there is a breakthrough point, a tipping point, whatever you want to call it, where things kind of take off. Again, we love to be involved with companies some, somewhere in here, and we love it when our core companies are over here somewhere. So that's what this chart is showing you. And then the other theory that we have explored in great detail here over the last uh, year and a half or so, probably going on two years now, Ken, is this notion that the projected return on value can actually be used a little bit earlier in company life cycles and uh, you don't need a PE to get to that number. So again, you're seeing S curves, not just theory, this stuff is real. And uh, if you can get to the right point on these S curves and uh, you know latch in on those tipping points on a very promising company, uh, it, it raises the probability that you'll experience another neogen. Your thoughts, Ken? Yeah, the only thing that I would add, Mark, is that uh, when you're looking at profitability, uh, it's very difficult to put a company on a best list that doesn't have any earnings of any kind. Uh, but you'll see when we put our companies out here that uh, we've gone right to the edge of that idea by looking at companies that have just very recently become profitable, uh, hoping to find some real early stage investing. Uh, you know, you can't be right every single time when you move into companies like that. But again, you don't have to hit more than a half a dozen home runs during an investing career. And when you're losing, those losses are capped at however much money you put in. When you're winning, there's no cap at all to what that gain might be in that stock. And that's the key, I think, that and patience and discipline, that's the key to putting together a really good nest egg. 
Okay, I suspect we'll come back to this slide at a future bull session and walk through it more carefully and uh, piece by piece. Just throwing it out there. All right, here's kind of our shopping list that we ended up with uh, from top to bottom. We're going to be going through these, but again, making the point that we're looking for companies with double digit growth, hopefully above 12%, and most of those are, if not all. Um, a quality rating greater than 60, that's the, so the top 40 percentiles, you're talking about good and excellent companies by our quality metric. And then we, because of the, we're dealing with so many earlier stage companies, we emphasize the projected return on value as much as the projected annual return. And uh, that's what the list is sorted by from top to bottom on the right-hand column. So that is basically where we went to work. Anything you want to add to that, Ken? Or? Yeah, no, I, I just want people to remember the name LGI Homes because it's going to come up later on in the presentation. It was an outstanding performer for us for a couple different years uh, in the previous list. Notice that it's gotten a little bit large now. It's up to about $3 billion in sales per year. And uh, just keep that name in mind as we move forward here. Yeah, it basically came down to a face-off with Green Brick and Green Brick being smaller with similar uh, potential. Uh, keep that in mind. All right. Go ahead and take us away, Ken, with uh, our selections. This one's pretty com common. Do you, are you, you're infatuated with this company, aren't you? I, I really <laughs> feel that, that we've, we've found a company that uh, in today's uh, society and today's economy has the uh, the probability, the, the potential uh, to really make uh, some decent money. Uh, and I think, and I know that you think as well, Mark, that Malibu Boats was a uh, kind of a slam dunk for a small company on our 2022 list. Uh, it made the list uh, last year. Uh, it was selected by uh, one of the mid-Michigan stock pickers during one of our COVID conferences. Charlene Hansen is the president of the Port of Value Investment Club up in Elk Rapids. That's near Traverse City, Michigan. God's country. And uh, it's beautiful up there, right? And uh, she knows boats. Uh, you live on the water and you know boats. Uh, I think that this company has a great potential going forward. It was one of those 38, 39% growers last year, lost to the market by a little bit, uh, but not enough for me to be concerned. Okay, so number one is Malibu. Another one that we have mentioned a few times is our number two selection, Sharps. Sharps Compliance is basically one of those companies that helps get rid of uh, bio waste, hazardous waste. And uh, they focus more on less on hospitals, more on pharmacies and different types of, uh, you know, home care situations, uh, long-term care situations. Again, if as you look to the visual analysis of the business model on the right, pretty hard to top that uh, revenue line. These guys are carefully expanding geographically. You can. Uh, this is also kind of a poster child for. We talked about the tipping point in that slide a few slides ago. And a uh, company makes that breakthrough tipping point moment, you become interested. But for whatever reason, these guys dipped, at, dipped back below zero. And uh, you don't think uh, stock prices follow earnings? I would defy you to look. I mean, just look right here. That's tracking. So, again, something to keep in mind. And, again, we, look, we keep the profitability in mind, too. Great company, well leveraged. We discovered this by following the, the two-lane students. Stocks under rocks. All right, next. Oh, I'm Axos Financial. Again. And we've discussed Axos at roundtables. It's been a favorite of Cy Lynch's, and he's put it into our roundtable portfolio a couple of times. Uh, you've seen some uh, better investing uh, full hour presentations on Axos. Uh, it's in the Tin Cup portfolio. Uh, it originally uh, was known as Bank of the Internet, BOFI was its original ticker, and this is a, a new style financial, no branch offices of any kind, everything online, and that changes the business model, changes the profitability, changes a lot of things uh, about the bank when you don't, no longer have to uh, open and staff uh, branch offices. 
Uh, we think Axos uh, has the ability to, to uh, over the long term, uh, be quite profitable. And so it was on our list and there wasn't much discussion about it either, although it is getting a little bit to the larger size. Uh, there, there are some benchmarks for banks and uh, I know Better Investing still labels Axos small, so 14.4 billion in assets uh, is on the small side of the asset divide and uh, we'll keep it on our small company list for the moment. Yep, wall position, pretty good stuff. All right, here's an interesting company that I had not really heard of, Ozon Holdings, and an uh, article from The Motley Fool about being excited about the Amazon of Russia. I read the article, I'm excited. I mean, this, this, uh, this, I mean, what, what's not to argue with here? I mean, dramatic growth. The price has been coming down and down and down over the last several months. Um, this is probably where I should stop talking, huh, Ken? Yeah, I think so. Uh, <laughs> we, we give each other, we give each other the ability to put a red card out there and to oh. basically say no, no, no. And this is one that I'm going to say no, no, no on. Now, I don't know why there's a picture of Mr. Putin here uh, when I'm giving the red card, but uh, I just don't think that uh, I want to look at a Russian stock at this particular what, point. Those weekly history. phone calls with Vladimir don't, don't count for anything? Well, I want to remind you what the Chinese government was able to do to Alibaba in the course of less than a week. <laughs> Uh, well, and the Russian government has the same ability to do that. Well, it's a peremptory challenge. You don't really don't have to have a reason, and you certainly don't have to have involvement from Vladimir either. So you just said no. All right. Sounds <laughs> good. No. <laughs> yet. So, so, so in that case, I'm going to switch from that Russian company, which, by the way, I would put on a pounce pile to watch. Not own yet, but uh, I, I think I would track that one. They He's are, going to put it on a pot spot, and if it does well, I'm going to hear about it is what's happening. That, that is okay. absolutely correct. So I, I'm going to yellow card myself here, but I'm also going to pull out, I'm going to switch gears and go to the other end of the list and pull something with a higher combined uh, rating when it comes to their return forecast and their quality. This is a company that's been featured a number of times, featured it at the round table. Um, it is a, a product that many people know. I did some field testing of one of their products last night. Um, the problem here with this company is how quickly the hard seltzer market turned and uh, turned in a heartbeat as apparently the millennials and the, the Gen Xers and Gen Zers or wh whatever, that whole group of people who love these beverages, you know, these fruity seltzers and all that kind of stuff, um, it changed unexpectedly. And our, my theory is that these guys will figure it out. It does account for up to 20% of their business, but uh, we're talking about making uh, a difference of maybe $100 million in that total sales forecast, which you'll see is really in the uh, not that big of a position, not that big of a hit. The matter that it was such a surprise is what cut this thing from a stock price. I think it got up over 1000 almost 1200 at one point. It's now down in the 400s. So it's, you know, the thing that attracts me here, decent looking growth situation. Yeah, it's going to have bumps along the way, but the current price is trading very close to the 52 week low. They have no debt and these guys have managed their well pretty their way through the challenges in the past. So I think I like this better than that Russian Amazon. I'll agree with you there, Mark. All right. And so we're five stocks in and I know Ken, is, his skin is crawling because he wants to talk about a bank other than X. I'm I'm a big fan right now of financial stocks. I have been for the last three or four years with interest rates as low as they are. And, and I really think the Fed is just about at the point now where it's finally going to start to tighten a little bit and the interest rates are going to move up. Uh, banks, meanwhile, have learned to be profitable in this very low interest rate environment. And as interest rates rise, banks will only become more profitable uh, we took a number of banks uh, uh, and looked at them. Uh, there's a list over there uh, on the left-hand side of the slide. You can see some of the banks that we put up against each other. Uh, you can see some of the numbers we, we looked at. Uh, RSI is a relative strength index. 
And when it approaches 80, maybe 90, uh, that's uh, definitely a signal for you to take a serious look at the stock and, and maybe it's in the sell position. Uh, there's a lot of other numbers that are given there, but yeah. return on assets. Go on, Mark. And I was just going to point out that we first uh, tagged Southern Missouri Bank Corp about a month ago as we be began this effort. It's up 47% in less than a month. That's why that yeah. number is red hot. It's too bad we weren't uh, uh, putting our list together 30 days ago, right? Well, you bought some. Yeah, well, I know, but uh, you bought some. I I would have liked to it, to it in the public uh, in the public portfolio as well. <laughs> Return on assets is a number I follow quite closely. And Mark, if you'll click just once to the next slide, okay. Uh, I put uh, the five best ones from that list uh, onto a stock comparison guide, uh, and I'm looking just at the top half of it, the guide that basically displays all the data from the different companies side by side so I can kind of compare it. Uh, the blue backgrounds I've added myself, uh, considering those to be outstanding to, to superior numbers for the bank. And, and then I've looked at what I consider to be extremely important uh, for quality. That would be the numbers boxed in red and for uh, something that I might want to invest in, uh, I would want a really high quality number, re a red return on average assets number, and then I would want a great pre-tax profit number on top of that. A return on average assets, uh, an average number is 0.85. Uh, so you can see that when that number moves above 1.5, uh, you have a superior bank. You have a really great one. And so I'm uh, finally coming down out of the list that we had narrowed in the original time to uh, MBIM, that's Merchants Bank, Axos Financial, which we've already talked about, and Southern Missouri Bank Corps, the smallest bank uh, on the list. And uh, I really like Southern Missouri, and we'll, we'll come back to a slide on it in a moment, but there's where I am with the bank stocks right now. So you like merchants, and I just wanted to bring one. one I'm I'm only going to use. Uh, I'm I'm not as aggressive as you. Uh, I'm <laughs> with my red card in my back pocket, and I'm just going to yellow card you on this one. Just just something to be uh, aware of. Um, one of the things that we do sometimes when um, you know for our analysis of banks, we do pay attention to book value and return on equity to form some of the forecasts. And one of the things that's absolutely true is there aren't any forecasts for book value. Uh, the only ones that you can really find are in value line, and that's only in the standard edition. So you, you really don't have that. So what I often will do is convert to an industrial analysis, just like if this company were General Electric or a, a regular company. And in that case, you're looking at uh, sales, revenues, and uh, net margins. And uh, what is interesting as I look at this company is they had quite a boost up. Uh, between 2019 and 2020, and uh, the analysts, it's a relatively small number of analysts, so I'll head you off at the pass here, Ken, um, they don't see that necessarily continuing. Um, it, was a, it was a boost that they had. First of all, people are saving more, so their account balances are going up. People are paying off some of their loans and their credit balances, so that's actually affecting that number also. And then these guys do an awful lot of FHA stuff, and they increased some of the incentive type stuff. I don't know the exact nature of the payments, but it was a boost to their overall revenues and profits in 2020. And I don't, I don't know if that might not have been a little bit of a one-time event. Hence, the analysts that are following this company, you know, have a, you know, it's it's strong, but it's it's plateauing a bit. So just be aware of that. Um, even with the plateauing, it makes the list. So I just bring this up just to, to be uh, mindful of watching for that type of thing. And I just want to remind everybody in the audience that uh, manifest investing charts always include uh, at least two years of future numbers. So if you check down at the bottom, you'll see that the last two dots on both those graphs are 2022 and 2023. So those are estimated numbers. Uh, we just feel that that data is important to gather and to 
look at as you're trying to put together a trend uh, for what's going on previously. So, so what's our next slide here? You, you yellow is, carded this one. Okay. This is not a full Will Robinson danger. It would, it's just a mini. Uh -huh. mini. All right, so okay. let's, let's see how we're doing. Uh, here's where the companies fall into the sector slots. And uh, like I said, uh, October 28th, they came out with their new list. Of 95 of them are covered. There were just a couple others that we needed to take a, a closer look at. Um, there's no truth to the rumor or little truth to the rumor that Ken took the Fortune staff out for dinner and, <laughs> and basically persuaded them to cover the finance sector uh, more than usual. But uh, could it could have happened. It could happen. And uh, and Ken, I, I really do believe that uh, Boston beer under these conditions is a, a staple, not a discretionary <laughs> consumer. Yeah. I, I see where you have it categorized, Mark. OK, <laughs> I'm, I'm not moving it. I mean, my wife won't allow me to put coach in discretionary. So, you know. <laughs> All right. Let's keep rolling on. Our sixth stock is one that hurt us this year. And this is kind of a can tell medical moment for me. Um, I still like the fact that these guys are working to help with a challenging situation. It's a it's a decent field of opportunity. Somebody's going to get it right. Could be them. But eHealth is uh, basically helping people optimize their Medicare stuff. And I do have a problem with the slide. I, I think that lady and her, I assume, husband, are they can't be looking at insurance quotes or that or they're ever, you know, those type of reports. I think they're watching TikTok or something, <laughs> image. But, uh, you know, fairly interesting situation, fairly dramatic uh, example of when a company stumbles. That's what the arrows are on the right-hand side, lower right-hand side of that chart. When they stumble and they disappoint, stock price gets crushed. But over the longer term, is there a chance that these guys are, are going to get it right? I, I, I think maybe. They're on a short leash. Well, and I'm going to throw a yellow card on this one, Mark, because I think that trend uh, of stumbling, that second trend, uh, tells me that, that eHealth is having a lot more difficulty penetrating the medical uh, market than, than it uh, is telling us about. Uh, I Just from personal experience, I think that, that these companies that are, are pushing uh, high tech into the medical field not only have to teach patients uh, that these are useful tools, but they have a, a huge task uh, ahead of them teaching the medical profession itself that these are useful tools. Uh, I think that, that uh, even though we know uh, how great some of these things can be to the convenience and to the, to the uh, health guidance itself, uh, a lot of doctors are just... Uh, resistant. They're running on what they've always done. And what they've always done is looked at a piece of paper in a paper file given them to by a real live nurse. Uh, they've never had to really update anything in an electronic way. And they certainly have never had to communicate with somebody electronically. They're used to talking to their patients for eight or 10 or 12 minutes in a in a small little room. And that's, you know, that's where it goes uh, from there. All right. So, so put are you kind. Are you out of yellow cards yet? Uh, we're no, I, I think this is the first one I've used, Mark. So okay. I used a red card before, remember? We're, we're 45 minutes in, so uh, okay. just, just keep those yellow cards in your back pocket. Go ahead. Okay, this is SGC. Uh, they make uniforms, a pretty mundane uh, thing. And uh, when I uh, delved into the company, I, I liked the growth characteristics. Uh, we're finding that more and more people in the workforce are using uh, parts of uniforms, and those are coming from companies like Superior Group. Uh, a full uniform is not nearly as common as it used to be, but uh, a coat or a long coat or a vest or a hat or various other accoutrements are very uh, uh, common in a lot of the different uh, industries that we're looking at. Uh, this company actually divides itself into three components. Uh, half or more, the 55%, the dark blue part of the circle, is the traditional uniform uh, group. And the gray part of the circle, the 7%, are specifically medical uniforms, things like scrubs and things like that. But 
a part of the business that I didn't know anything about is that 38% of the business right there. And that's related uh, different branding of different types of uh, clothing and different types of, of uh, I don't know, uh, tchotchkes if you want to uh, they brand an awful lot of stuff with company names and then they allow the companies to sell these things so it might be a pan or a clipboard or a coffee mug or or all kinds of stuff and it makes up 38 percent of their business so uh, i i think it's well positioned as a small company and has the 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 right characteristics to maybe grow itself well, Ken, on my Christmas wish list, I, and I'll send it up your way. I, I have Dunkin' Donuts yoga pants on it for me. There we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go ahead. Try to get that image out of your head. All right. Silicon Motion <laughs> Technology. Uh, Chip, a semiconductor company. It's been uh, discussed at some length in uh, in a lot of our social or our, our, our forum discussions and a number of things over the years. Um, interesting company, um, probably well positioned to take advantage of some of the stuff they've got. They've got chips in everything. Uh, I, I could have put pictures of cell phones, everything up there. So they are leveraged into the automotive stuff and uh, very well positioned, very well managed. And uh, they've been on the list before. So they're back. And uh, welcome back, Silicon Motion. All right, here we go. Another Another bank. Here's my third bank, Southern Missouri Bank Corps, the smallest of the banks that we've put in. Uh, uh, oddly enough, it's located in Southern Missouri, <laughs> and uh, it has great characteristics. Uh, uh, move your eyes to the very bottom of the slide, the last line in the evaluate management section from uh, the data uh, on a typical SSG, and you'll see return on average assets. The most recent number there is 179. Remember that 1.5 is a, a superb number, a terrific number, and 0.85 is an average number. So this bank has been above average for the last 10 years, and it's moving into the superb stage at, at with really uh, pretty, pretty uh, low numbers as far as assets are concerned. 2.7 billion in assets is really considered to be a very small bank, and yet this one seems to be managed at a very, very high degree of efficiency. Well, if Mark, I think you're putting a yellow card on me there. Yeah, a little bit there. Well, first on the upper left there, if if you haven't had enough financial sector names from Ken yet, you can actually go and and check out this presentation from uh, August where he, there's 150 more regional banks with uh, above average return on assets. So you can check those out. I'm yellow carding just because it's been red hot. It's up almost 50% a month. That's that's not the end of it all, but it, it is trading up high. So I wouldn't be surprised to see it hit a little bit of a plateau or a catch its breath type zone. And I'm, I'm putting the card back in my back pocket because I'm heading you off at the pass here, Ken. It's only basically back where it was three years ago. So it's uh it might take a bit of a breather, but um, I'm not too concerned about that. Sounds good. All right, iRobot. Uh, a lot of you know this company personally, as these these little things run around your house and vacuum your floors. Um, uh, it has been presented at a couple of our conferences. It was on the Forbes Best Small Company list. Uh, they are doing a lot of cross selling and upselling, and uh, they continue to dream about uh, a lawnmower. That's uh, the same type of thing. In fact, we have a couple of them that are being tested in our neighborhood. It's really kind of cool, but uh, pretty good characteristics. It did get overpriced. It has sagged back a bit to the point where it can uh, be eligible for consideration. Um, interesting company. Mark, I'm getting a comment, uh, a factual comment on that slide. Okay. Is that uh, is that uh, appearing on the Forbes Best Small Companies? Should that be 2021 rather than 2012? No, that's I, I I specifically put the twelve there because that's how long, how far back it goes. How long it's been on the list? Okay, that answers it for our our audience member. Okay, let's keep going then. Been there quite a while. So here's our sector diversification as we go with our fantasy football chart. You can see Ken is dominating with his banks, and uh, 
we've spread out a little bit into technology, so let's keep going. Uh, this company is MKS Instruments. Uh, MKSI is the ticker, uh, especially since 2015. Uh, I think they've been hitting on all cylinders. Uh, what I really appreciate about this pretty small uh, revenue size company, uh, 2.3 billion, and that's pretty small for somebody making high tech kind of uh, things. Uh, they're the leading product in 15 different categories, and they have over 2,200 patents uh, that are approved. They have many, many more that are pending. So I think all in all, this is a pretty decent growth story. Uh, got hit pretty hard by COVID, and uh, you can see that they recovered really nicely uh, from 2019 to the present time. Yeah, and there's no shortage of roundtable discussions and a variety of different bull sessions, that type of stuff on that company. All right, here's a quick one in the uh, infrastructure realm, not just any old infrastructure, but real infrastructure, transmission and distribution, a little bit of alternative uh, advanced energy there, but MYR Group. This is an engineering and, and a construction company. A lot of project management, a lot of in installing the hardware. Uh, they represent a bunch of utilities, a lot of the Midwestern utilities, and uh, have done work for them. Pretty straightforward story, headquartered out of the suburbs of Chicago, but they've got operations from Chicago to Texas and east and west in both directions. Um, really interesting story. I, I like the fact that it's uh, it, it's leveraged into fixing the stuff that we're going to need for the infrastructure for electric vehicles and uh, just uh, uh, basically keeping the electricity onto my house because it's very unpleasant when the electricity goes out. And a uh, 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 hat tip and shout out to Marie Frank. She is always giving us these type of companies. Appreciate you, Marie. All right, Ken. I'm looking at Metafast here. Uh... Uh, Metafast reinvented itself around 2015, and so I'm only showing the the data from 2016 onward. Uh, the company has certainly been on a tear during that five-year period. Uh, they've completely changed the way they sell. They've moved to a coaching kind of a model where uh, you get people that have bought the uh, Metafast products, and you also get assigned a coach uh, who is a customer themselves of the Metafast products. You can read much more about the whole uh, uh, setup uh, on their website. Uh, Metafast deals basically in weight loss products. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, it's an interesting uh, take. Uh, I think the uh, unique business model uh, has had enough time to shake itself out and if it were going to fail, I think it would have failed by now. So uh, with five years plus uh, of data on this uh, model using these coaches and with phenomenal growth, let's put Metafest on the list. Yeah. And the way I would encourage people to kind of maybe um, capture a, a way to remember this, and I, I think of it as a Peloton type uh, model. Um, those of you that have Pelotons or know people that do know that the personal coach thing and the and the live interaction coaching is a big deal and it works. All right, let's go on to uh, healthcare, especially healthcare for acute or elderly patients. And uh, this one kind of falls in line with that eHealth a little bit, only it's on the deployment or implementation side. Ensign Group, well managed company for medical care facilities. You can see a pretty decent uh, top line there. Look at the business model analysis. The sales has been pretty steady. The profitability has been fairly steady. It's a jungle out there. I get that. Uh, everything that Ken said is true as far as really uh, capturing this market and doing it well. Um, one of the things that I am uh, uh, pushed to is a fairly recent discovery in InsiderMonkey.com by that guy we mentioned a few minutes ago, Chris Jenner of Rock Springs Capital Management. And I've, I follow him pretty closely. I don't remember the last time he took almost 6% of their total asset, and we're talking a large chunk of change here, and invested in a similar company in medical care facilities called Agilon Health. I presented it last month's roundtable. Ticker symbol's AGL. That's even earlier stage. 
But the fact that he's doing that just begs, you know, it basically attracts my interest. I want to understand what he sees and, uh, you know, why he is tracking these type of companies. So adding Ensign Group to the list, ENSG ticker. Uh, Gentherm, uh, it's, it's an auto uh, supplier, but uh, in my mind, it's as much a tech company as anything else. Uh, they hold a lot of patents and uh, they do a lot of work with uh, climate. Uh, they have a very high tech seat that controls the temperature of the seat and not just through uh, some very rough controls like you might have in the auto that you currently drive, but it's a very sophisticated way to control uh, everything in the seat and keep you warm or keep you cool. Uh, there's a, a couple of articles that allude to the fact that G Gentherm has signed a very large contract with uh, one of the largest makers of electric cars in the world. That's as specific as it gets. No numbers, no names, uh, but Gentherm seems to be on a roll with its high-tech uh, concepts. Uh, they do a lot of work for electrical vehicles, uh, and they're also doing a lot of work with uh, dealing with home heating controls and ways of managing uh, heating and cooling uh, at the household levels. That doesn't mean they're making furnaces. What that means is they're finding ways to control uh, what's happening with that uh, heat and that cooling air as it comes into the to the uh, environment. So uh, I, I kind of like it. Uh, that's a value line quote up there at the top corner. Uh, and value line really thinks this has uh, a, a really good chance of good appreciation for the next three to five years. Yep, probably a little bit of bumpiness. A uh, quick update on our our chart, you can see that uh, we are spreading out pretty well. And as Ken said, you could actually put GenTherm over in technology, much like you would with the GenTex. All right. This one's yours too, Ken. Fulgent. This is Fulgent. Uh, and uh, I, I like these companies that are dealing with the human genome. Uh, and Fulgent, you can read for yourself the description of the company. And here's an example of a company that in our minds uh, – has the possibility of really blossoming into a home run. It's just now become profitable after being in existence for four or five years. Uh, it showed uh, a good growth from 14 through 19. And then in 2020, it hit profitability and the profits have moved up nicely since then, along with the uh, sales. Uh, a lot of this uptick in profits uh, was due to a huge contract with the CDC uh, for COVID-19 testing. Whether or not COVID-19 will continue to be a huge part of their uh, mix with revenue and with profit remains to be seen. And I think that, of course, depends on, on where we are with COVID three months from now, six months from now, one year from now. Uh, but I think it's the kind of company that uh, begs the question, uh, are you willing to put a few dollars down on an emerging growth company that seems to have a lot of things working in its favor? Yeah, and you'll note that the price has come down off of the 52-week high, so that's uh, maybe it's already pricing in some of that uh, relaxation back to normal business levels. Yep. All right. I'm going to bring Car Gurus, ticker C A R G. This is basically a, a company that's in the auto trader, cars.com type business, but uh, I had not heard of it. But it actually has more traffic and more activity, more commercial stuff going on than all of those major competitors in this realm. And the way that if somebody who's familiar with this realm would describe it, some of those are uh, legacy companies that can be a bit clunky. Uh, I know it's a highly technical phrase. These guys have, you know, are more of the modern fintech type version of that, and that apparently is is good for them. I would call them almost a a Richie's brothers for the uh, uh, individual car market. So this this one's a little bit dicey, but uh, showing great promise, and they are uh, they're competing effectively, and uh, we'll put them on the list. Green Brick Partners. Remember I asked you to remember the LGIH uh, 
idea uh, from much, much earlier. One of our big winners, LGIH Homes, and it's just gotten too big to be considered a, a small company anymore. Well, Greenbrick uh, is another home builder. And if you look under the uh, gross margin graphs of, of the home builders, uh, at least uh, many of them, you'll notice that the best margins come from LGIH, but close behind in second place is Greenbrick. If you look at the uh, debt that the company is carrying, and we're learning to, to that debt for a home builder isn't necessarily going to have to be at the 40 or 50 or 60% level. You'll see LGI has the second lowest debt in the industry. And again, green brick right behind it uh, with the third lowest debt. Uh, it seems logical to us to replace LGIH with green brick partners, a real unique business model. We've presented it. Matt Spielman's been a big proponent of this company. And you might go back to some of our roundtables to get a perspective on the different kind of business model this builder has as it uh, grows throughout the country. Yeah, very selective about who they partner with and where, which is kind of the whole thing. Well, Essent, you're sneaking in here with another financial one, Ken. This is Essent Group, and Essent Group uh, is basically an insurance company, uh, and they focus on PMI, that's private mortgage insurance, uh, and they focus on reinsurance. That means writing insurance to cover your insurance company. So... Um, uh, Essent Group, that's very specialized kind of insurance. Uh, and they make the point in their investor presentation. I took a paragraph out of that presentation at the bottom of the slide there, uh, that while COVID-19 has significantly impacted the U.S. economy, it's really had very little impact on the housing industry. Housing did slow down in uh, the end of 2019 into 2020 as a lot of the uh, activity was halted for a period of months, but it's since rebounded pretty nicely. And as it rebounds, the need for private mortgage insurance has is always there. Uh, it used to be that you didn't need to buy PMI if you were gonna put down 20, 25% on a home, but virtually nobody puts down those types of down payments anymore. You put down much smaller down payments and then you buy private mortgage insurance for your mortgage. Uh, it's it's just, a, in, in our minds, a, I own this stock in a couple of my investment clubs and uh, they make the point in the third bullet on the, on the bottom of the slide that the housing industry just, uh, uh, while it's going to have its ups and downs uh, month by month, uh, the general trend is going to be up simply because of the size of the cohort that includes the millennials right now. Those are the folks buying first homes, uh, moving up to second homes. Those are the folks starting families. And those are the people forming households where a house is something that they really have on the top of their priority list. So I, I think investing in the home building industry and in the industries that support that industry uh, can be very profitable if you pick the right companies. Good stuff. All right. And number 20, uh, we did want to keep our international exposure, in, including some of the more um, challenging areas of the globe to a minimum, but this is one that keeps coming up on our lists, and we, we basically gritted our teeth a little bit. Not fancy. They have rooms and they have buildings. Um, Green Tree Hospitality, um, behaving pretty well, pretty well managed, if we can trust the numbers. And we know that uh, you take them with a grain of salt. But uh, these guys have a, a, a pretty good uh, thing going in China. It's uh, predominantly, if not all China. They do have some ar around the planet but uh, very China dominated and uh, all indications are that things have been uh, spinning along pretty well. There was some COVID impact. Uh, China was not immune, but uh, a pretty good story. So GHG is going to be added to the list. This will be on a short list or a short leash, I should say. 
well, well, Mark has the Russian company to hold over me that I red carded, and so now I have one to hold over his head. We'll watch both of them very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so our distribution actually did end up being a little bit light on technology. You could move Gentherm over there, and it would even it out a bit, but fairly typical type of uh, interest captured by the companies in this year's list. All right, there's a dashboard. You can see the, the URL, the link to it at the bottom. That is a public link. And uh, we begin tracking them as of now. Uh, Ken, I was kind of impressed that we came up with such a high quality rating, certainly qualified on the growth at uh, 16 to 17%. That's a yeah, I don't see anything wrong with the averages at the moment, Mark. They're they're good, solid targets to aim at. Uh, and if we can put ourselves uh, even close to those targets, keep those uh, numbers, you know, uh, by the end of the year, then I think we've, we've done a, a really decent uh, job. Uh, everybody's predicting growth in the markets closer to average next year. Uh, and average would be 10%. So... If we could pull in 16, 17, 18 percent, uh, that sets us up for perhaps a, another beat. Yep, pretty good list of companies. Look forward to tracking them. All right, this year we're going to try something a little bit different, uh, a little bit innovative. This is something that many of you have asked for. Uh, we did create a situation using M1 Financial. M1 Financial was inspired by some of the stuff that we've uh, looked at with Graham Stephan on, on YouTube. And uh, this is a situation where we created, uh, we're going to create a real money account to track these holdings and put a couple thousand dollars into it. And uh, you're invited to come along and you can actually mirror it with an investment. Now, I think this is kind of cool because we all know that it's really tough to find good small company uh, funds to invest in. Brown small company is uh close to new investors and there's just uh, not a whole lot of opportunity. So if you're intrigued by what we've been doing and you want to uh, play along with us, uh, keep in mind that if you were to create an account with at least a thousand dollars, you get $30 manifest investing will receive $30 as a referral bonus. If you put in as much as 10,000, we'll get 150. So the thing I find kind of compelling about that is that's better than what you can get on a savings account or interest rates or, or CDs right off the bat. If uh, you invest in, put 2000 in, you got $2,060 to start off with. So uh, again, uh, this is a, a look at what you can do. You're invited to go ahead. That is the referral link for us. We would greatly appreciate it. And then we both win as a result. And then once you're in, you can actually use that link to invest directly in the, the 20 companies that we have described. The graphic is a, a look back, uh, kind of a back test as, as to what those uh, 20 companies that Ken and I just reviewed would have done if we had put $100 into each of them uh, exactly one year ago. So pretty nice run between October and January. I might actually use that for a, a January effect uh, presentation, Ken. The, the left-hand side of this chart, isn't that something? So anyhow, uh, Ben has his hand in the air, Mark. So uh, I think we're going to wrap up first and then we'll uh, take hands and we'll take questions. OK, OK. Just a quick reminder about our conference on the 10th and 11th. It's a series of four webcasts, the last session being a, a panel discussion featuring stock selections, other discussions uh, along the way. But uh, again, more information is available on that at Manifest Investing and via the Better Investing Mid-Michigan chapter. And with that, I think we go ahead and sign off with, uh, it is uh, the eve of Halloween. And that is- Happy story. Halloween, everybody. I'm going to be spending it with my favorite vampire. She's three years old and she is excited. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is excellent. Yeah, we are going to uh, find three grandsons and we might actually come up your way, Ken. So. I'll, I'll let you know if we do. We might actually swim. Sounds good. All right. Sounds good. So I'm going to go ahead and shut down the recording. Uh, good luck out there, everybody, and uh, keep the keep the ideas coming. It's never a bad time to hunt for good, and I call them wonderkins. We'll have that debate on bull sessions here in a couple of days. Good. All right. <laughs> faster growing, promising, early stage, faster growing. I said that twice.
companies. Thanks, Ken, for all of your help on this, and uh, let's have some fun. Sure enough. Goodbye, everybody. Uh, if you want to 